Welcome back to Hawaii Real. Here we are with my good long time buddy for about 15 years. I've known him. Yeah. Kaleo Hosaka. He is a uh, jiu-jitsu fighter. Just recently had a professional bout. And um, he's going to tell us a little bit about how with that and um, what inspires him to do that at like such a late age in life, buddy. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> we were just talking before this. It's like, you're in your late 40s, yeah? Yeah. It's like, what inspires you to just continue doing jiu-jitsu profession not just teaching jiu-jitsu because you also do that you teach yeah. jiu-jitsu you coach um you've been doing jiu-jitsu how long since 1991 okay so kind of a long time because we're not going to do the math now 20 like, about 28 years <laughs> 20 years <laughs> yeah so 20 years so like um the rankings in jiu-jitsu where does that put you um as far as like black belt so right now I'm a third degree black belt. Mm -hmm. So after you hit black belt, after every two years you get retested, you pass the test and you get another stripe or another degree. So the black belt goes up to 10 degrees. And after 10 degrees, they give you what they call a corral belt. It's a red and black belt. 10 years after you get that belt, then you achieve the red belt. Is there, is it have to be time or is it like yeah. testing too? Or? Yeah. Once you get the black belt, everything is tested. Mm. So it's usually some organizations, the first degree is after your third year, but with under my master, which is Helsing Gracie, he believes after two years, you should be tested again, eligible for your first degree. So for us, our system, it's every two years. Okay. All right. So, so you said your master is uh, one of the Gracies? Yeah. Is he, what's his relation to like the family from Brazil? So, um, Helson is the second oldest son of Elio and Hoyce and Hoyler, they're Helson's younger siblings. Oh, okay. So how it all started was, um, this guy, Isao Maeda, he was, um, a diplomat for Japan when the immigrants were coming here to work the sugarcane fields. They were also going to brazil to work the cane fields in brazil mm, okay so he saw Maeda was a diplomat but at the time he was also a judo champion so my instructor's great grandfather was a politician so he helped set up the camp for the japanese so it's um a thank you he offered to teach his oldest sons judo mm. which in that time is jujitsu so judo jujitsu is pretty much the same thing as far as groundwork which is the call name waza Mm, and then after they learned judo, they specified just on the groundwork, not so much the throws. Everything was, um, they formatted it to their own style, which was strictly groundwork. So that's why they call it Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Oh, I see. Okay. And how long have you been doing ju Gracie Jiu Jitsu? Or is it just um, I've the been 20 years you've been doing it? Uh, 28 years I've been doing Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And um, before that, I was a wrestler. So I guess that's how I got into it. Because at the time, back in 91, I was living with my auntie because my parents had just moved to the mainland. Mm -hmm. And my two younger cousins, Mike and Chris Onzuka, they were students at UH. And they basically stumbled upon Helsin's class. So I think it was Mike was the first one to go check it out. Then he came back, oh, you got to try this. So mm -hmm. I went, I go, hey, it's kind of like wrestling, it's ground. Yeah, let me try it. And then... After taking the first class, I was like, damn, I was hooked because I got all these small guys kicking my ass. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> well, that, that's like the thing with jujitsu. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't matter size and everything, right? It's yeah. a lot of technique and what you know and stuff. Yeah. So I, eventually the size does make a difference sure. when you basically are on the same level. You guys have the same technique. You guys are the same rank. Then, yeah, of course, naturally size and strength is going to take, you know, it, it basically it's going to be a factor. But yeah. if you're just starting out, you're learning the same as the guy next to you. A lot of times it's a smaller guy that's going to, it's going to work more for the smaller guy because they can do a lot more. Mm. Where for the big guy, like I tell my students, because I'm big, when I move, I, I leave a lot of space. So for the smaller guy, the space that I leave, it's an advantage for him because that's his opportunity to escape or attack. Mm. Or I got to constantly be aware of, am I leaving too much space? Can I move a certain way? What are you talking about space? You're talking about like between your limbs and stuff? Uh, I basically, I leave too much space between me and my opponent. Okay. 
where anytime I try to separate or try to move, I leave more space than a smaller person would. Okay. So if I'm rolling against a smaller person, anytime I try to separate from him, I give him that opportunity to escape. Mm, okay. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so for me, my game is all pressure-oriented. So I tend to stick to my opponents. And basically, that's the reason why, because I don't like to give up space. Right, okay. So if I give up any type of space while I'm trying something, it works for my opponent. And it's a disadvantage for me. So I try to play a real tight game. How long have you been coaching and tra- and uh, teaching? Mm. Coaching, I would say probably the last 23 years I've been coaching. So almost as soon as you started, yeah. or just a few years after you started, you started coaching. Yeah. And then because my younger daughter was introduced to judo at a young age, the head instructor at Leeward Judo Club found out that I taught jiu-jitsu. So it's like, well, you teach ground stuff. Why don't you teach the kids? That's all they do is ground Come over stuff. over here and yeah. teach us all. Yeah. So I've been up at Leeward Judo for the past six years. Oh, okay. And before that, you were I was at, a class out? I was teaching a class out at Queen Street mm-hmm. under Helsin. But that academy actually moved. So I went back to teach with my cousins, which is O2 Martial Arts Academy. And that's located in IAL by Cutter Ford. So I teach there every Saturdays. All right. Is there like a, you know, like with martial arts, Asian martial arts, there's like a, a spiritual side to um, like karate, kung fu. There's, is there that kind of same kind of uh, mm-hmm. spiritual side to jiu-jitsu or no? Not really. Not really. I think that's what kind of um, drew me to it because it was so informal. Right, right. But at the same time, that's why I had my daughter start in judo because of the formality, just to learn mm. the etiquette of bowing before you get on the mat, mm-hmm, bowing mm-hmm. to your instructors. And we're slowly bringing that back into jujitsu. But when I first started, it was like my instructor go, hey, buddy, how are you doing? Come. There was no formality of bowing to my sensei or I stuff see, like I that. See, I see. Okay. So I, it was really laid back. Yeah. Because jujitsu is like really, it's really popular in Hawaii, right? Yeah. Do you think because it's so informal, that's like one of the reasons it was taken on as opposed to like judo and other? I think more of that, you know, we grow up with the law spirit yeah. and we're laid back. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that drew people to jujitsu in the early days is because everything was just laid back. Mm-hmm. But when it came time to spar, it was a different animal. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I but mean- And what people don't realize is when I started, we were the only game in town. We were the only school. And there was a waiting list to get in. So if you couldn't handle the sparring, there was always somebody willing to take your place. Wow. Okay. So they called it the shark tank. And <laughs> basically, yeah, if you didn't get hurt, you weren't trading. It's a little cutthroat then. Yeah. Wow. Where now it's more, you got all these different schools all over the island, mm-hmm. and now it's become a business. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you got to cater to your client. You can't beat up on your client or they're not going to come back. So it's kind of like, I'm not saying watered down, but it's not like how it was in the old days. Because if you only have one place to go, you're stuck in that one place. Now with the schools, are there like different tiers for um, for the schools as far as like um, how advanced the fighters are and whatnot to the point where you have like the beginner guys that, yeah, okay, it's really easy and it's a more of a business aspect. Hey, let's try to get more people in and just teach them like the basics and stuff as opposed to like an advanced school where it's just like you said, hey, there's a line of guys trying to get yeah. in. I and think if you don't cut it, you're not, you're not in this class. I think all the schools kind of have a same business plan when it comes to something like that, where mm-hmm. they have a separate beginner's class and then you have your advanced class and then you have a competition class mm. and the guys who go to competition class, they basically know what they're getting into. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's a dog eat dog kind of class. Mm-hmm. You, you're going to get hurt. You're going to, you're going to get tired. You're going to throw up. They know what to expect. So even when I was teaching my class, I kept, the competition class separate i did a separate competition class because i knew my saturday students that wasn't for them right so before i started my saturday my fundamental class i would have a competition class and then whoever wanted to stick around they could stick around for the fundamental so to be successful to be a successful school you gotta have separate classes Mm because if you're gonna throw somebody into the advanced class who's there the first day they're going to get lost and then they're yeah. going to like, why then I don't want to be there. Yeah. Right. So you get you to gotta, be successful. You got to have catered to the customers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
Yeah, no, that, that just makes sense. Um, are you in one of the competition classes or do you actually get trained still or are you at a point where you're not really? I think what, um, at this point in time, after getting your black belt, you kind of realize that there's so much more you don't know. Yeah. So I, I'm always learning and I'm always, I even learn from my students and that's why I still roll because I still roll with my students. They catch me, they tap me and I'm like, hey, what did you do? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, that's pretty slick. So I, I'm constantly trying to learn stuff. And I think when you start as a white belt, it's like, oh, man, I want to get my blue belt. Get your blue belt. Oh, I want to get my purple belt. Get your purple belt. And it's like, oh, get your brown belt. When you get your brown belt, I'm like, oh, I don't want my black belt. I'm not ready. And then when you get your black belt, you go, yeah, I'm not ready for my black belt. But then at the same time, you realize that there's so much more to learn. Yeah. It's just now you have a solid base on the fundamentals. It's just that. Now you, you just got to fine tune everything mm-hmm. and you're always learning. And I've seen guys where they chase the belt. All they're af- after is to get promoted. And when they get their black belt, they're excellent competitors, but they can't teach because they don't know how to basically tell people how they do things. They, yeah, They it, know how to do it. They, yeah. they've, they've been doing it for years, but they, they just don't know how to break down what they're doing into its simplest form. And explain it to somebody who's never done it before. Yeah, and that's like with, I mean, any sport, you're going to have that. You're going to have athletes who are just really good at the sport but can't coach. And then you're going to have coaches who maybe aren't so good physically, athletically, but they have the mind for um, the sport and they're the ones coaching. And I think that's where our our school is kind of different where it comes to promotions because we have a lot of guys that don't compete. So we kind of have a two-tier type of, um, well, not two-tier, but two different criteria when it comes to promoting mm. for those guys that don't compete we really pay more attention to them in class to see if they have the basic knowledge and they have the practical they know how you know, practical knowledge and know how to apply the move if they can do that you know we can't hold them back they, they know how to perform the move they can basically explain the practical application of the move so by right they, they should get promoted so that's how we look at those that don't compete for the guys that compete, you know, they're beating all their peers. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, by right, we can't hold them back either because basically other schools will say, wait, you're sandbagging this guy. I mean, mm-hmm. he's beat all the competition at Blue Belt. You can't keep him at Blue Belt for another year. So those are the two things that we look at when it comes time to promotion. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. So it's not like karate There's no kata. There's no kata. The only time there's a kata is when it comes to the black belt. Well, just for Helsin because... And for people who don't know, kata is what? Um, a prearranged form of moves. Right. So even judo has their own kata. It's called kata gumara, where you have, I think, nine different cycles, and there's three or four moves per cycle mm-hmm. that you perform. So jujitsu doesn't have that at all. It, you guys are um, ranking people or promoting people based on their ability their ability to perform the move and the techniques or their ability in competition oh i see so if you have a guy that's just started and he's beating a guy who's uh, already say a blue belt so in that form if the guy has some type of other martial arts background yeah. saying like judo or yeah. wrestling mm-hmm. we'll hold him back for a while because they're beating the our, our student with wrestling and judo not so much jujitsu okay once they learn how to beat the student with jujitsu and apply their wrestling and judo mm-hmm. to jujitsu because that's what i did i basically beat people with pure wrestling mm-hmm. i wasn't beating them with jujitsu but then when i learned how to beat people with jujitsu i was able to add that wrestling technique and that judo technique into the jujitsu technique nice so i think Jiu-jitsu, guys ask me, oh, is it going to help me with wrestling? Is it going to help me with judo? I go, no, because you're strictly on the ground. You learn how to fight off your back. Mm. But judo and wrestling will enhance your jiu-jitsu. Mm. Okay, I see. It's an interesting way to put it. I don't think I ever thought about it like that. Because you have a lot of the the team-based sports where like, you can play multiple different team-based sports, and they can all help you be better at the other sports. Yeah. So um, wrestling and judo are those two sports that will enhance your jujitsu. Mm. If you can learn to apply what you know in judo and jujitsu, I mean judo and wrestling into your jujitsu game, yeah, you'd be pretty tough. 
So do you want to talk about that, uh, your um, bout that you just had? Do you guys call it a bout or what do you guys call it? Bout, match, fight, match. whatever the people want to call it. Well, it's um, it's an, they, they say it's an invitation only, but you have to apply. Okay. So apply you, for the invitation? Yeah, okay. pretty much. Okay. And then he'll call you, let you know, okay, we got to fight. You'll be fighting this guy. So I did it last year. Mm -hmm. um, I fought this guy from Kuhuku. Nice guy. He trains under um, Dylan Baker. He's um, he's from Kahuku side. And the match was basically eight minutes of me trying to pass the guy's guard. And it went to the judges. The judges gave it to him. So I'm like, okay, cool. I, I love the experience, but I was like, ah, you know what? I'm going to take a break. I just did the Worlds, and I was like, ah, I'm just going to take a break from training. Then I get an email. Well, not email. He, I get a post on Facebook saying, well, are you going to enter? This year, I'm like, okay. So I turned in my app a like, oh, week, week and a half before the tournament. He's like, yeah, we got to fight for you. you going nice. to fight at 225? I'm like, yeah, okay. I jump on the scale. I'm like, oh, damn, I'm 240. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, you're not 225. But <laughs> yeah, I was like, two, two, oh, shit. Okay. So what did you have to do? Cut, cut a lot of weight? Well, the thing is, I intermediate fast. So okay. what happened was the weekend before I got the call, I had a bunch of family parties. So I was eating, I was drinking, and I was like telling myself, I applied for the, the the tournament maybe a month and a half ago. I didn't hear anything, so I'm not like going to deprive myself of spending time with my family, celebrating stuff like that. So if I get a fight, I'll deal with it. I got a fight. <laughs> I had to deal with it. So the this way... Like crash diet right there. No, actually, what happens is because I intermediate fast regularly, and that's basically what I do. Because I was eating bad and drinking, after the first two days, I came back down to 2.30. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. so... It was just a matter of getting down to in that last week, getting down to two twenty six because they're giving a pound. So I weighed in at two twenty six. Okay. So, but I was no fighting sheet because you just lost yeah. almost twenty yeah. or fifteen or so pounds, right? Yeah. So we're bad at math. Sorry. <laughs> so basically, my training for this fight was basically strategy. I would put myself in certain positions and basically fight my way out of there. So my game plan for this fight was basically stand up for two minutes and then pull the guy into the guard and attack from there. Mm. Okay, so your game plan was a fight from your feet? Yeah, so uh, the game plan was just try and take him down and wear him out that way. Mm -hmm. So that was my cousin's game plan. That wasn't mine. But because they're my coaches, okay, I'll go with your guys' game plan. So four minutes, I'm trying to take this guy down. This guy is about 18 years younger than me, and he's a stud. He's a CrossFit athlete. I'm like, okay. You're not going to wear him out. Yeah. So I'm like, they go, he's getting tired, he's getting tired. I'm like, yeah, no, he's not getting tired. <laughs> then I hear his corner, oh, jump to guard, jump to guard. I'm like, hurry up, jump to guard. No, he doesn't jump to guard. So I'm like, okay, I got to make something happen. So in wrestling, they call it ankle pick. So what I did was I had a collar grip near his neck. Dumped his head down and I reached for his ankle. But when I reached for his ankle, I overstepped, so I was extended. And as I touched his ankle, my body—I didn't have a good base, so he just boot, basically blew me over and ended up. I ended up on my back and him on top of me. He secured what they call an Americana or a shoulder lock. They mm -hmm. call it a key lock. So I fought out of it for a while, and then basically his stomach ended up on my face. I'm like, oh damn. I'm like, okay, I'm tired. I can't breathe. I got this guy's stomach on me, and he's got a good hole on my arm. Sure enough, he torqued it. I'm like, okay, I'm tapping. You win. <laughs> I go, if I, I felt like if I went with my game plan, I might have had a better chance because the thing is, I know my body at this point. Right. And I knew I was solid for two minutes standing up trying to take him down. If I pull him into the guard, He's basically got a fight to get out of there while I can attack. So I can conserve my energy. I can conserve my gas. So that was my game plan because I knew I wasn't in top physical shape. I was in good enough shape just to, you know, give him a fight and possibly win. But I had to use strategy. And then when my cousins told me to use a different strategy, I'm like, I'm not uncoachable. So if they saw something that I didn't, okay, I'll follow you guys' game plan. Mm. So I went with that. Didn't work out. But again, I don't blame my cousins. If I was in better shape, would have been a different story. Right, right, yeah. right. So, and hats off to my opponent. I mean, he earned the win. The kid was a strong, he was a stud. He came in ready. I came in out of shape and old. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, blame, we'll blame age on yeah. this one. This loss was due to age. <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, but 
the promoter Seth Daniels has done a great job promoting this show because he holds this show all over the country and basically he loves to come back to Hawaii just because of the crowd. I mean, and it's a different rule set because what we our governing body in Jiu-Jitsu is called the IBJJF, mm-hmm. International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. And it's more of a point-based tournament where you can win by points or win by submission where this one was a submission only and if you didn't submit then it goes to the judges which is kind of trying to promote a more of fast pace attacking style type of show Mm -hmm. which people like and it showed by the turnout at the Hawaii Convention Center and the thing that um, I think he does that you know makes it worthwhile for you to fight is you get a cut of your ticket sales nice so not only do you get paid if you win, but if people buy tickets under your name, you get a cut of those tickets. So that's a great way to do it. Yeah. So without without even me winning, I still made three hundred dollars. Nice. So that the way he's promoting this fight is good. I mean, he's coming back in six months, so mm-hmm. that says something. Because basically, his first show was kind of like the his first show in Hawaii was the. Uh, fight to win 100 and that's their 100 so basically he did it to stick a finger in the face of everybody that said he couldn't do it mm-hmm. he said I want to take the show to Hawaii and I'm going to prove you guys wrong and basically he did he proved everybody wrong it's a sexual show why, why Why don't they think they can bring it to Hawaii just not enough people are interested in it or we have a small population I think they underestimated the the jiu-jitsu talent here on this oh. island because what? What, what a lot of people don't realize is we were the first, Helsing was the first instructor to bring a team outside of Brazil to compete in the World Jiu-Jitsu Championships. And he's here coaching. Yeah, and he, the team he brought, four of them medal. They were, they won the most medals from anybody outside of Brazil. And you got BJ Penn, the first Hawaiian black belt, mm-hmm. and he won the Worlds in 2000. Mm-hmm. So and I he mean, went on to have a successful a career. UFC career. Yeah. yeah. So you have a lot of talented guys in jiu-jitsu. And that's why at the time, the world were in Brazil, but they brought it to California. So now you're able to see more of the Hawaii fighters because it's a lot cheaper to fly to California than it is to Brazil. Yeah. It just goes to show that there, the, you have to look at the, base of the, the amount of schools on the island. Mm-hmm. Basically... Helsing Gracie, we have about eight schools on the island. You have Caverina, which is CJF, uh, BJJ. They have three schools on the island. You have Seven Seas, which is based out of KB. You've got about 20 schools just on the island of Oahu alone. So Jiu Jitsu is popular. Yeah, no, I mean, um, you know, people in the UFC have talked about fighters from Hawaii. And how they just have a different kind of culture coming out of Hawaii. You know, it's a it's a fighting culture, a warrior yeah. culture, um, where you know kids grow up and they do like to scrap and they do get involved in fighting, and they're just not afraid to fight. And I think that's one of the things they're not afraid to put in the hours of work yeah. to learn and get better. And uh, there's a saying where you can't teach heart, and I think that's what kids from Hawaii have that are different from the mainland mm-hmm. because they always have something to prove. So. You have kids, you have the fighters from here, they all have heart. And that's what it is. That's that X factor that you cannot teach. Mm-hmm. And that's what the Hawaii fighters bring is that X factor. They, mm-hmm. they all have heart. I think it's interesting because you have, um, you know, I play hockey, play uh, roller hockey out at uh, the Kapolei. <laughs> and the same kind of similar thing where people from the mainland look down on the islands because you know it's hockey and you guys are in the middle of the pacific ocean yeah. what do you guys know yeah. and you know we built a or there was a, a rink that was built up and they brought in a uh, professional coach from the mainland and he coached up the kids and the kids were there several times a week uh to, for practice and then on their off time they could go there and just fiddle yeah. around if they wanted to and what you saw was that the Hawaii kids were getting really good at hockey yeah. and they would take their teams and go to the mainland, all different age groups, and bring back all kinds of medals from tournaments in the mainland. And then um, we would have tournaments here. And the first tournament we had, we had um, a big team from, big club team from California come and they brought a bunch of age groups um, here also. Yep. And um, basically they got pasted. 
they got <laughs> they didn't win any medals they sucked compared to the local kids and um i think one of the drawbacks from that though is that uh it was hard to bring those clubs over to hawaii right. after that because it's like well we're gonna spend all this money on a trip we're gonna go to hawaii and get our butt kicked oh, yeah well we don't really want to do that but then the, the teams from hawaii would go to the mainland and, and kick butt yeah and i think it's that the kids from hawaii were basically undersized were always underestimated so we got it's not that we got a chip on our shoulder it's just that we have something to prove it's kind of a chip yeah it's kind yeah. of it's a but, big chip but we we go to the mainland works in our favor yeah that we we have something to prove yes because you guys already are discounting us yes and i think that's what a lot of the hawaii fighters have is that they feel that we don't have the facilities like they do on the mainland we don't have mm-hmm. these ultra gyms where each person has their own personal trainer they got their masseuse and stuff like that you guys get, look at the cooper brothers they train out of their damn garage and he's going to be fighting for a million dollars in december wow 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 so i mean that says something yeah you go you don't uh, people are under the misconception that you need these gyms you need these coaches you need this you need that to be successful mm-hmm. but the hawaii fighters are kind of proving that wrong where you got Max Holloway who basically trains mm-hmm. on the island, doesn't go to mainland to train. All his coaches are here. Um, Rylan Lazares is a jujitsu coach and he's been highly successful just training on the island. Mm. It's like that with our football teams too. You know, recently we just, or this, this year, all the, um, all of our top high school teams here in Hawaii played mainland teams, right? Yeah. And all of the Hawaii teams won. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and they weren't like, crappy mainland teams they're really good teams yeah. and i think only one of the games was close the one against milani right yeah. milani and was it liberty liberty yeah uh that was close and milani came back and beat them and the other teams like punaho went to the mainland yeah. and totally beat the crap out of the team that they went on their home field you know <laughs> and then i think st louis beat bishop gorman yes and you got to look at this who's on the coaching staff of bishop gorman who's that um what's his name brown Chris Brown, the XUH lineman. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so a lot of the coaching staff on these excellent mainland teams are from Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And you got a lot of expats whose kids are playing for Bishop Gorman. Mm-hmm. So you got the Hawaii kids and the Hawaii talent playing on the mainland. And then you got like the little uh, baseball players going to the Little League World Series, yep. you know, and doing and being really successful almost every year. Yep. You know, it's it's kind of amazing for the population that we have that we're putting out such good, committed athletes and teams and stuff like that in a wide range of sports. I think it's beneficial for us because we are on island. Mm-hmm. And that's basically one of the few things we have is organized sports. Because growing up, I basically all year round I played sports. Mm-hmm. And every kid I knew, they played some type of sports. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the advantage that we have because we're stuck on island, ain't much to do but sports and go to the beach. <laughs> I think it's all that sunlight we get. Yeah, or something in the ocean water. I don't know, make us you know stronger. <laughs> Who knows? But I want to do that with lacrosse now because um, you know lacrosse is one of those sports that can totally be uh, a hit sport here in Hawaii. You know, it's got the physicality of football and. Uh, and you know a lot of the skill sets of like basketball and baseball so yeah a lot of running and stuff that uh, soccer has so it's got a lot of the things from all these different sports definitely think it's gonna be successful we'll see but yeah going back to the fight to it i think it's going to um only popularize the sport of jiu-jitsu especially in hawaii Mm mm-hmm because they're looking at a, you don't have to be a name fighter. As mm-hmm. long as you have the rank of purple belt, you can put your name in the hat. And if you're lucky enough to get drawn, you got to fight. So they just draw names? They don't like look in comparison to? Ooh, they look in comparison. Okay. But if um, they can't find somebody and just so happens that you're same rank as him and close in weight, mm-hmm. you want to fight? Okay. You got to fight. All right. Or... For the younger kids or the young, well, actually adults, because I'm in the seniors now. 
But in order, you're almost, you're almost in the masters, though, right? <laughs> the grandmasters. They, they got away with the masters term. They just call us seniors. Oh, and they just group you into <laughs> yeah. the... seniors one, seniors two, seniors three, senior four. They got up to senior seven. Okay, okay. But for the adult world, you actually have to qualify, mm -hmm. meaning you have to have won so many tournaments in the IBJJF, where that's a disadvantage for the people from Hawaii because they would have to travel around the country to compete to get points enough to compete at the Worlds if you're a brown or black. I think brown belt too, but I know black, you have to be, you have to have accumulated enough points to enter the world because it's so popular now. Because when I entered back in 2007, when they first brought it to Long Beach, you didn't have to qualify. You could just put your name. But what happened was the bracketing. There were so many guys entering. They said, oh, you know, we got to have some kind of qualification or prereq in order to get into the worlds. Now, what kind of frame of mind do you have to have to um, be really successful or you personally be successful at, um, um, yeah, I mean, coaching, teaching, but also competing and stuff. Like, I mean, you do it all the time, right? Yeah, well, I'm fortunate enough where when I coach, I think about me being an athlete and how I needed to be coach. And I read every of my athletes differently. Each person responds to a different stimuli. Mm. What might work for this guy might not work for that guy. I mean, they may be equally talented, but to get the most out of that individual, I might have to try something different. Some guys, they, you know, they like to be all that. They like to be put through fire. Some others, I just got to work with them slowly to get to where they need to be. So I think being an athlete and knowing what works for me I'm able to empathize a little bit more when somebody's not motivated because we all get to the point where we're kind of burnt out. Mm -hmm. So I got to try something else with that interview mm -hmm. where I got this guy who's a hard charger, really might not need to do so much with him, just, you know, fine tune him, maybe pull the reins in from stopping him from getting hurt. But I might not have to work so much with that guy where this guy here, I might have to work a little bit harder. Yeah, that's like um, not just with coaching and stuff, but that's also like the new um – mentality that teachers are taking with their classes and stuff like that. It's like not everybody, not all the children learn the same content in the same yeah. fashion. Like you can't, not all kids can sit there, listen to a lecture yeah. and absorb that material. Like a lot of, a lot of times boys just can't, like they want to run around, yeah. they want to get their hands dirty. They want to actually, um, you know, deal with things tactile. You yeah. know, I think one of the guys I was watching on YouTube was talking about how, um, boys are more into things and girls are more into people yeah. and relationships and stuff like that. And I think when you look at the broad, um, spectrum of our society, you kind of see that, you know, you have like engineers yeah. are mostly guys and things like nurses and teachers, they're mostly women. It's, yeah. it's just how they choose to, to go. There's nothing good or bad about either of those. But I think when you look at it, you have to really dwindle that down to how they are at school in the elementary middle and high school ages is like hey that's their interests yeah. like they're going to learn differently you can't expect them to all to to learn the same way and you, you still have your daughter coming back yeah yeah and that's yeah. what i find with my daughter too is that she's more of a social it's who she needs to have friends mm -hmm. that's what completes her and when she doesn't have a friend or Somebody's not talking to her. She kind of takes it personal. And then where if it was me, I'm like, I could care less if you're not talking to me. Yeah, it's like my older son. Yeah. Like, he could care less if he had friends yeah. with him or not. Like, he's totally fine going yeah. off on his own, doing his own thing, and not being peer pressured or not having to be in the, you know, in the popular group yeah. or anything like that. He'll just do his own thing. And it's, yeah. so he's totally fine with that. And luckily he's found um, other friends who are kind of like-minded in that, in that sense. And they've kind of gelled together. And it's just a few of them. There's only like three or four of them in the group. And um, I think that's why my daughter's still in judo because for her, it was social. All her friends are there. All her friends mm -hmm. are still there. So it's, oh yeah, my friends are going, I'm going to be there. So it works for me. Whatever gets her there, I don't really care as long as she's there. Nice. But yeah, yeah when it comes down to, yeah teaching individuals like I have two types of students you have those who can 
learn from examples. If I demonstrate a move, yeah, they can get it. Mm-hmm. Or you have those that got to be hands-on, so I got to actually work with them hands-on mm-hmm. so they can get the mechanics. So visual who can actually pick up on the technique that I show. Right, just watch you and yeah. then do exactly as you did. Then you have the others where I actually have to go hands-on right? so they can get the mechanics. They have to feel the move. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, I'm a little a bolt. There's times where I can just pick up by watching, mm-hmm. but there's times like, wait, I actually got to get in there and figure it out. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my game is that way too, is like when I play with somebody, I usually analyze their game by having them tap me and I'll get tapped multiple times just to see, okay, what is this guy doing to catch me? Then the light bulb comes on. Oh, he's doing this. Okay, so what do I have to do to stop it? So I, I can learn both ways, visually and hands-on. Have you found that it's just always a learning process? Like oh, yeah. you haven't, there's yeah. no there's no stop to how much you can learn here. Yeah, um, guys talk about my pressure game and how it's this and how it's advanced, but I'm like, there's always room for improvement. Now, what would you say to someone who's trying to, uh, or just looking around for some uh, martial art to sign themselves up for, sign their kid up for, as far as jujitsu? As far as jujitsu, well, what I tell them is, if you want them to get oriented with the groundwork, start with judo because judo has a good base. Judo mm-hmm. has a good base for every sport out there because you learn to fall. You learn balance, and also you learn respect. Basically, you learn the formalities, bowing, you know, listening to your instructor. And so, like so you start getting your kids ready to be coachable. Mm. Then they can venture them out into other sports. That's, that's just my personal belief. That's what I found. So when guys ask me, hey, you know what, what do you think I should start my kids in with? Yeah, I might be biased because I teach jiu-jitsu, but practically I'm like, you know what, have your kids start in judo, and these are the reasons why. And then when they think about it, it's going, yeah, makes sense. Because mm. you, you, you're you forced to bow before you get on the mats. You're forced to go look for all the black belts and bow to them. So basically, you're acknowledging that you're showing them respect. You acknowledge that, yeah, you're my instructor. I'm here. Cool. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so judo to start out with, guys, for uh, martial arts for your kids. Yeah, judo. All right. Now, do you do any kind of um, working out or anything, or is it just jujitsu and that's good enough for you to keep in shape? Do you mm-hmm. need like CrossFit training? P ninety X. P ninety X. You still do that? That's yeah. from like yeah. No, no. I, I a long it, time ago, man. <laughs> the only reason why is it uh, works. It, a lot of it is um, not, uh, plyometric, mm-hmm. uh, body weight oriented. So yeah. there's not so much stress on my body because I'm old, but. I didn't realize how stressful yoga was till I did the P90X yoga, and that thing kicks your ass. Hey, it does, man. <laughs> I haven't done P90X since mm, 2007, maybe. Yeah, so I'll, I'll do um, the cardio, and then I'll do the warm the workout itself. Yeah, but I like the cardio because it starts off with the yoga. So I mean, I like the yoga for the stretching mm-hmm. and the flexibility, mm-hmm. and it's helped with my lower back issues. Yeah. I should get back on that. I used to have all the little DVDs and stuff. Yeah, I still yeah. got the DVDs. Actually, I had to go buy, I had to go on eBay and look for the DVDs that aren't working anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I got to find those. That, that's a good thing to get yeah. back into P90X. and yeah. can do it right in your right. Yeah, home. exactly. I, I, I got my dumbbell set up in my garage. I got my yoga mat and then I'm good. Yeah. I just set up my computer in the garage and I'm good to go. <laughs> okay. But at the same time, I, I, if I have the opportunity to go to the workout at a gym, I'll go and do elliptical and other stuff, assault bikes, stuff like that, just to get my heart rate and that fat burning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Especially when it comes time to cut weight, I, I, I do a lot of that. So you're not a CrossFitter? No. Okay. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, I tell my kids. I'm, I'm a beer drinker. Yeah, I'm that too. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I tell my, my students, I go, you know what? You want to get in shape, go join a gym. I'm here to teach you a martial arts. I'm here to teach you how to protect yourself. Yeah, completely different. Yeah. Uh, if you want to be the top tip shape, you're in the wrong place. Mm. I go, if you want to enhance and be in shape, by all means, go to a gym. But if I'm going to run you through a workout, then I'm taking away time from teaching you the martial art. Yeah, because you're not a gym, you're a school. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Um. So the question was posed, what inspires me to compete and what inspires me, what inspired me to do jiu-jitsu? Well, mm. again, it, because I wrestled in high school and it was 
the most similar to wrestling of all the martial arts besides judo. That's why I picked it up. The reason why I still compete, I, I'm just competitive by nature. And it's not the thing about winning or losing. It's more of just testing myself to see, hey, can I still hang with this guy? And where do I stand among my peers? Because that's the same thing I tell my students. I mean, I don't care if you compete. I will encourage you to compete. And the only reason why I encourage you to compete is you train with the same people every day. This is one opportunity where you get to go outside of the school, train with somebody who's supposed to be, you know, the same rank, same level in you. You can see where you're mm -hmm. with, with your peers. And if you lose, well, you learn because now you know where you got to improve. If you win, okay, you know, eh, it's working. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what inspires me to compete. It's not, I don't say it's inspiring me. It's just that that's just me. I just like to compete. Just I like testing myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I do it so that my students can say, hey, you know what, if he's doing it, yeah, maybe I should try it. And it also doesn't give them an excuse. It's like, oh, I'm too old. It's like, no, I'm older than you. I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still doing it. And that's the one good thing I like about my classes. I have more of a 35 and over. Mm. They're all professionals. And they know they're going to come to my class. It's going to be safe. Because my thing is, you guys got to go to work. Yeah, I'm not here to kill you. I'm not going to let any of the other students beat you up during sparring. It's like, we're all professionals. We all have lives. We all have jobs to go to. This is something just to learn. It's a tool. Again, it'll keep you in some type of shape, but at the same time, you're learning something that you can use to defend yourself on the street because the one difference between us and a lot of schools is going back to kata. When you become a black belt, your test is a kata. There's over a hundred and something self-defense techniques, and we get tested on every one. So in order to get your next degree, you got to pass that kata. And um, before, when my instructor's follower was Elio Gracie, started jujitsu, when he started his school, you had to learn the self-defense before you even learned the groundwork. So basically, a lot of self-defense is um, it's geared towards women and men, but it's a lot of grabbing, so a lot of real-world situation where mm. a lot of times, for females, you're not going to get punched, you're going to get grabbed. Mm. And a lot of defense, the self-defense we teach are grabs from the standing position, being grabbed from behind. Um, if you're taken to the ground, the guy headlocks you or basically mounts you and then pins your hands. How to escape from that position. And what I tell my, my students is, you got to understand this. No self-defense is 100%. Mm -hmm. What it is, I'm teaching you a tool so you don't black out in that situation. At least you know you have something you can use and you can stay in the fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people don't realize that, you know, the world is a dangerous place. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen to you, who's going to get into yeah. a fight, who's going to try to mug you anytime that can, you know, you just never know. You yeah, never know. Yeah, what I tell my students, it comes down to situational awareness, being aware of your surroundings, mm -hmm. okay? And then manage the distance. Because if you can manage the distance, you can manage the fight, you can always run away. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have to right. engage. But you know that if you get attacked, at least you can defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And I tell them another thing too is, if you do have to defend yourself and the guy gets hurt, you have to be able to articulate why you did what you did. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're smaller than this guy and this is why you had to snap his arm because he was go-oriented, you knew he wasn't going to stop, you're in fear for your life. So you got to be able to articulate why you went to the extent you did when you defended yourself. And you broke the guy's arm. Yeah. <laughs> or why'd I kick him in the kneecap yeah, and yeah. Bre break his knee? Well, he's just trying to mug me with a gun. I don't yeah. know. So you just got to be able to articulate. That's the one thing I teach my students is, if you're going to use this stuff mm. in a self-defense situation, mm -hmm. is it necessary? And if it's necessary, how can I articulate why I did it? Mm -hmm. People are probably wondering, why the hell has he got a Stormtrooper helmet on here? Disney Plus. Disney Plus, everybody. This is in honor of uh, the Mandalorian. Yay, it's a Stormtrooper helmet. Yeah, they got a... I don't have a Mandalorian helmet. Sorry. Yeah, the show is like crack. It is. Yeah. It's such a good show. I'm so happy with... Um, I saw the baby Yoda. John, John Favreau. John Favreau? Yeah. Yeah. The director. So happy with the work he's doing on that. And just everybody's all giddy. 
say, yay, somebody's actually doing Star Wars right. <laughs> I'm just like, what is the next episode? Yeah. Oh, man, we got to wait till Friday. Friday. Oh. That's the only thing, and I know why Disney Plus is doing it, how they're, they're airing episodes every week instead of like Netflix, how they'd air the whole season. Yeah, the whole season one yeah. time, you could binge watch it. That's because they don't have enough content on Disney Plus yet yeah. to have people like subscribe for months and months and months and months and months. So I know why they're doing it. It just sucks. I think if they updated their library, because a lot of their library isn't mm-hmm. coming into 2020. Mm-hmm. So if they would update their library, they would keep people watching until... Because I'm looking at all these movies, I'm like, oh, it's not coming into 2020. I'm like, ah. <laughs> what about this one? No, no, not coming to 2020. Ah, well, hell. Okay. Yes, I'm still going to pay for it. I'm still yeah. going to be here. I'm still going to be a slave to Disney. Yeah. That's fine. Because yeah. now they own, like, the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, Marvel, Star Wars, Wars, Fox. Ugh. Yeah, I went out and bought Endgame, and then I got Disney, and it's on Disney. I'm like, Great. Great. I don't even buy DVDs or Blu-ray anymore. It's just, it's not worth it anymore. No, I have a Roku. Oh, okay. So I or I basically downloaded it onto Roku. Okay. I paid for it. And I'm like, so I can watch it anytime on my phone and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, Disney. Damn you, Disney. <laughs> I bought that movie and I bought that movie. Yeah, I'm a Star Wars freak, as you can probably tell. I would have a full armor. Full suit of armor if I could, but they're like three grand or something like that. Yeah, my wife would kill me. Yeah. <laughs> Did you follow along with like all the Star Wars cartoons and stuff like that over the past couple of years? No, and I, I tried to watch Clone Wars, but it's like, oh, uh, there's just too many episodes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to binge watch yeah. cartoons. They're not that interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have the, uh, the new cartoon, uh, Resistance, which is supposed to be like before... No, during no before the um, new trilogy, I think. So what is it? It's supposed to be like Rogue Rogue One. Oh, actually, Rogue One was before. No, Rogue One was before Star, Star Wars, Wars yeah. Episode Four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this takes uh, Resistance is before um, the Force Awakens, I believe. So the Mandalorian is after the Rebels win. It's five years after Return of the Jedi. So after Return of the Jedi, they blow up the Death Star, yeah. celebrate with the teddy bear Ewoks. Uh, five years after that, oh. so you have um, warlords or imperial warlords and stuff yeah. all over the place, scattered throughout the galaxy. The Empire is not really there anymore. Uh, it's kind of fractured. But um, and this is like the geekiness of my Star Wars thing. Um, the Empire is so big that when the Emperor was killed and kind of fractured the Empire, the actual um, military of the empire um, was still effective in like all these solar systems throughout the galaxy. So they still had a really big presence. So I think um, having the stormtroopers and stuff in, yeah. in, the, in those episodes uh, was fitting for the the history and the lore um, that has taken place throughout um, throughout the past couple of decades uh, with people writing the books and stuff. Um, about the Star Wars and what happened after Return of the Jedi and stuff like that. So. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to place the timeline, <clears throat> but I really was like, okay, you have all these stormtroopers that are, mm-hmm. and then and the stormtroopers are all dirty, dirty. but they're still stormtroopers. Yeah. yeah. And then the Yoda thing. Yeah, this spoiler alert, everybody. Um, but you know, if you haven't watched it yet, so I don't care. You're getting spoiled. Yeah. But yeah, um, is that his reincarnation or? Well, see, well, the scientist guy that yeah. was there, he had a patch on his uniform, and people were saying that that's the patch, the symbol for the clone facilities oh. from the original or the prequel trilogy, and from the Clone Wars. That that's where that guy's patch or his uniform has the markings for the clones. So I don't know. Is this a clone of Yoda? I don't know. Interesting. I mean, it's the same color. Yeah. And he has, obviously, force powers as a baby. <laughs> Can you imagine having a kid that could just, like, lift the yeah. house up, lift the car and stuff as a baby? 
and still like yeah. take a marble and put the marble in their mouth and try to chew on all kinds of stuff. It's like, God. Yeah, life would be hell. Yeah. Reminds you of like um, The Incredibles. Oh, yeah. Jack Jack. <laughs> uh, that one fight scene with Jack Jack and he's fighting the raccoon and stuff. It was fucking hilarious. It's like, what power is he going to get? No. All of them. <laughs> he has all kinds of powers. <laughs> right, buddy. Thank you so much for coming on to Hawaii Real. Oh, no. Uh, Thank you for having me. Good luck to you and your schools and stuff. And Thank you. Um, yeah, let us know uh, next time you have a bout. We'll do. Are you going to do one again? Maybe? If he asks me, I'll do it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not going to go out and play it, but if he asks me, then I'll play again. Are you going to put yourself at the 225 or are you going to put yourself at like maybe the higher? No, actually, when I compete in the world, I come down to 217. Jeez. Disgusting. That's really light. Well, um, because our weight class in the world. Because you're a big guy. I mean, you're not. Yeah. So my weight class is 209 to 222 with the gi on. Okay. So the gi is anywhere between four or five pounds. So to get to the top of my weight bracket, I try to come down between 215 and 217. Between there, I'm safe with my gi. Cool. Cool. I didn't know they added the gi into it. Yeah. That's interesting. So it's only for the IBJJF. That's the only tournament you weigh in with your gi. And to um, cut away with the weight cutting, you have to weigh in right before your match. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so you cannot suck weight and rehydrate. It's um, If you don't make weight when you step on the mat, you're mm -hmm. automatically disqualified. Wow. I mean, that's good and bad for some people. Yeah. Man. Anyways, everybody, thank you for watching. And as always, stay happy, boy. Thank you. All right. That was cool.